Welcome back guys, it's Caleb from Caleb the Video Maker 2. This is going to be a continuation from the previous video which talked about a machine learning algorithm's ability to generalize. <laughs> Did I even say that in the video? Crap. I totally forgot. That's kind of important. Anyways, <laughs> that's okay. It's part two. I still got a chance. We're going to be talking about generalizing. <laughs> Oh man. Continuing from the previous video, we had these two rows here that we did not have enough data for because our historical data set was not large enough and didn't have all the different combinations of data. Well, I wanted to talk a little bit more about when we have the four different possible models, how the machine learning algorithm is going to choose which one of the four besides just magically we are going to try to come up with a legitimate reason as to how the algorithm knows which one is going to best represent reality. And as always, it's always going to base off of the historical data. So I did change this table a little bit. This part is the same because this is just all possibilities of data, but I did change the actual results just to uh, make my example a little bit easier <laughs> because like I said it's very challenging to see trends in data so I made the data very trendy so I could see those trends and then point them out <laughs> man I sound terrible I, I don't feel very good oh gosh the previous video we took these two rows and we came up with all four possible models that could represent reality and the reason we had four is because we didn't have all the data we needed, so we had to write down every possible model to represent reality. And there was four of them, as I explained in the previous video. So now, how do we choose which of the four is the best? And this is something the algorithm is going to do, so we don't really have to worry about it, but it does make sense to you know, comprehend such actions of machine learning algorithms. So that's what this video is about. We have these two rows where we do not have enough historical data to represent because in our historical data, we did not have anybody who was a female who was older than 50 and did have a family history. And we also did not have anybody who was a female and was older than 50 and did not have a family history of diabetes. So our data set is lacking. So we are able to guess the values here most appropriately using the other attributes uh, that are available up here. This will make a lot more sense once we talk about the ID3 algorithm later on in the series. But for now, just follow with me and we'll try to get the bare minimum needed to understand this concept. So how does an algorithm generalize beyond the data? How does it make predictions like that? It has to do with attributes that are very discriminatory. And we're going to be talking about that as well in an upcoming video. <laughs> so machine learning kind of requires a lot of words that you know take a while to understand. So I apologize if I throw a lot of information at you that I haven't really explained. Just bear with me and it'll make more sense as you go on in this series. But if you look at our historical data, you can see a trend. You can see that any time the family history is yes, the person ended up with diabetes. It's awesome. You know, that makes it so easy. If they don't have a family history, then they did not get diabetes. So that means we are able to look at these two rows and predict what these values would be based on the data we already have. So even though we don't have any data that represent these two people, we don't have a complete representation of reality, we can still figure out the data. Yeah. So following this pattern here, this person does have a family history, so yes, and this one would be no. Oh, I hate when that happens because my nail goes like A female who's not under 50 and has a family history would have diabetes. A female who's not under 50 and does not have a family history would not have diabetes. This here is the missing piece allowing us to completely model reality 
even though we don't have enough data to do so. <laughs> Boom! And that's the beauty of it all. <laughs> we can know what's going to happen even though it hasn't happened yet. It's crazy. Ooh. Now, obviously, it's not going to be that simple in reality because, you know, we're not going to have this one-to-one -one correlation here. So that is why we use computers, <laughs> because a computer might be able to look at all the little things and find the most likely correlations between data to get the most likely model. Simple, but super complicated and confusing. <laughs> now there's one other thing. You look at this and you're probably like, hmm, okay, this, this is faulty, because you know, for one, this is not enough information to determine whether someone has diabetes or not. And two, you know, like you could have you could have two people that are exactly the same using these attributes and one has diabetes and one does not. Yeah, that yeah, you totally called me out because this is very faulty. The reality is that this kind of system here would be perfect for something that's very concrete and black and white. For example, if we wanted to classify whether emails were spam. Well, that would be very simple. You know, we could have, does it contain images or files? Is it from an unknown sender? Is it from out of the country? It has, has this person sent you mail before, etc. And we could make rules to say that, oh, if it, if it has images attached and it's from an unknown sender and it's from out of the country, it's automatically spam, guaranteed. But diabetes is a little bit more complicated because it's not so black and white. So keep that in mind as you go into the series that this is going to make predictions, but it is not foolproof. It will get better over time, and that's one of the key, the key things with machine learning is it's continually improving. But the just the reality is we can't know for sure whether someone's going to have diabetes or not just based on historical data. We can get pretty darn close though. <laughs> so that's what we are trying to do. We are trying to predict what's most likely. And how do we deal with issues when we have people with the same attributes and the, the, the end result is different? Well, when we define an algorithm, it's going to be done in a group kind of system. So we're going to need more data than just one person who is, you know, female over the under the age of 50 and has a family history of diabetes that's probably not going to be enough because it's going to be more of a kind of like a balancing system to where we look at maybe let's say we look at 2,000 people with these attributes and let's say 90% of them had diabetes so 90% had diabetes and 10% did not. Well, this is more likely how it's going to work because it's, it's not black and white in this situation. We can have two people with the same exact attributes but different results. And it's going to take the majority based on a large group and use that as its basis to define the result right here for this simplified version of reality. <laughs> I hope that made sense. If it didn't make sense, I'm, I'm sorry, but just think we need more than just one instance of every single possible value because one is not enough to represent reality. You're going to need a lot more data when you're not dealing with black and white things like classifying email as spam. <laughs>